Ukraine was a relatively obscure country to the American West prior to the recent 2022 Ukraine-Russia war. It's an Eastern European country and is the second largest European country besides Russia. It sits right above the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. Had it not been for the war, not only would many of us not have paid attention to Ukraine, but we definitely would not have uncovered its deep-rooted history. Similar to the Iraq War, it seems as if destiny has an interesting way of pulling our spirits to places of our human past that need to be preserved. In a dualistic act of this tragedy, these events destroy human lives and human history, but allow us to take if at least one last look into our esoteric history in these places before it is completely demolished. Ukraine, as I will show, was home to one of the oldest known civilizations known to modern people. And because of this, there has been much fanaticism by various political and academic groups to connect their ancestry with the ancient remains of Ukraine. The Sumerians and their homeland, modern-day Iraq, used to be thought of as the oldest civilization known to modern man. This fact took many painstaking decades for scholars to admit after we discovered Sumer under the ground in the 19th century. The Sumerian culture goes back to about 4500 BC. We now know that there are remnants of even older civilizations than that of the Sumerians. The Sumerians themselves told us about one that was contemporaneous with them and could possibly have been older. In a text known as Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata, written near the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC, we find that there was a rival empire to that of the Sumerians known as Arata. The text is the longest known Sumerian epic which details a story about the Sumerian hero king and Merkar and the king of the legendary Arata having aggressive back and forth arguments and battles mediated through their servants. Along with this text are about three other stories that surround the same story including the legendary Arata. These tablets have caused many scholars over the decades to try and locate the legendary Arata. The only clues we get from the tablet is that Enmerkar's people had to travel through a mountainous range of seven mountains and a desert plain to arrive at Arata. It was a place rich in minerals, specifically lapis lazuli. Apart from that, Arata was home to the prominent worship of the goddess Inanna. There's no need to divulge into the many theories as to where Arata might have been, but one convincing argument comes from the work of 20th century Armenian architect researcher, historian, and archaeologist Martiros Kavukshian in his Armenia, Sobartu, and Sumer. In his grand book, he makes a compelling and logical argument for the conclusion that Arata was located northeast of Iraq in Armenia. Now, this topic could be examined further, but is not necessary for this particular presentation. What's interesting is how a group of fringe scholars in Ukraine took to the Arata legend and tried to tie it to their homeland. The search for the ancient past of the European people has resulted in various fanatical explanations, debates, and dangerous political ideologies. It all begins with the supposed Indo and Proto-Indo-European migration. This theory, in basic, states that there was a center of pastoralist people living in central Eurasia and around Ukraine, and from there the Proto-Indo-Europeans, or the Pies as they are sometimes referred to, spread out in all directions, bringing their language, myths, and customs with them. The various languages that belong to the Pai people are Indian, Armenian, Iranian, Germanic, Balto-Slavic, Albanian, Celtic, Hellenic, and Italic. For example, the word brother in Greek is frater, in Sanskrit, brater, in Latin, frater, and in Old Irish, brother. This hub of people goes back about 10,000 years ago, with massive migrations clearly taking place about 5,000 years ago. The pie theory is also used to explain how blue-eyed white people came about and also where blonde and red hair might have originated. The pie theory in itself is hotly debated and has been used to justify fringe nationalist claims throughout the centuries. In regard to Ukraine, there were plenty of post-Soviet writers 
who were pushing a neo-Aryan theory to justify a deep-rooted history of the Slavic people. A branch of the Proto-Indo-European people was the Indo-Aryan people, who would specifically go off to originate the Germanic, Slavic, and Indian peoples. The history of the Indo-Aryans has been spun around by each culture with claims of ancestral supremacy. An early academic influencer out of Ukraine's post-Soviet era formulating a cultural basis for the Ukraine-Indo-Aryan theory was Natalia R. Guseva. Born in 1914, Guseva was a scholar with a degree in Indology from Leningrad State University, among other academic and professional achievements. She was influenced by the works of 19th century scholars Helena Blavatsky, Balgan Gandar Tilak, and Fabre de Olivet. Each of these scholars wrote about the mystical theories having to do with the supposed Aryan race, some of which taught that the mythical race went back to a sort of Atlantean era. There was a cultural movement among Guseva's peers that led to many works of literature and art about this legendary homeland of the Slavonic people. It was a later addition to the Germanic Aryan race theory. Her work was expanded with the help of her student, Svetlana V. Zarnikova, who was also a writer on the Slavonic Aryan theory. Zarnikova's work, along with her teachers, was picked up and disseminated by various Russian newspapers, journals, magazines, and even national TV shows. Later Ukrainian fringe archaeologists furthered this theory with more extravagant claims. Two in particular, M. Chimyakov and his colleague Yuri Shilov. Chimyakov wrote about ancient Slavs being the core of the Indo-Europeans, while the rest branched outward from Ukraine. He claimed that the ancient Ukrainian Slavs existed in the region for over 10,000 years. His colleague Yuri Shilov took things to an extreme and was among the first to claim that the Sumerian rival empire of Arata was Ukraine and that the Sumerian kings originated there. With no actual basis to prove his claims, he later retracted some of his sentiments due to the new evidence showing a different explanation. Another prominent fringe writer during the 80s and onward that added to the Ukrainian Aryan theory was Anatoly G. Kifishin. He claimed to have found proto-Sumerian inscriptions near the Sea of Azov, southwest of Ukraine. These inscriptions were never verified. All of these mystic writers, especially Kifishin, have influenced other researchers in the truther community. Heather Lee and Tim Hooker, for example, have been giving presentations on the supposed Arata Ukraine connection for over 15 years based on the work of the aforementioned scholars. Russian historian and senior researcher at the Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology at the Russian Academy of Sciences, Victor A. Schnurlman, speaks on the issue in his meticulous paper on the subject titled Russian Response Archaeology, Russian Nationalism, and the Arctic Homeland. Of the matter, Schnurlman concludes that all the fanaticism was really centered around the agenda to create an independent Ukrainian state, as he states here. One of the reasons the remote past acquired such significance among these authors was that it provided an academic legitimation for an independent Ukrainian state. All of this fervor was coming straight out of the post-Soviet era, which caused a sort of renaissance of politically driven academia to strengthen the national sovereignty and pride of the Ukrainian nation. Schnirlman informs us that astute academic specialists refuted and descriptively disproved the mystic arguments of the Ukrainian Aryan theory. Despite the pushback from orthodox historians and archaeologists, the works of the mystics continued to influence pop culture and were featured in various media. Schnirlman detests the fanaticism of the mystics by stating that Shilov's claim that the earliest prehistoric communist Indo-European state of Arata, which is said to have flourished in Ukraine in the 6th to 3rd millennium BC, is a fantasy that exceeds even the Nazi imagination. The Nazis did not fathom such a long Reich. Basically, saying that the excitement around proving a deep-rooted history in Ukraine that supersedes all the other Indo-European cultures was heavily politicized. There was also a mysterious book that helped shape the Ukrainian mythical identity that has now since been discredited. This book was known as The Book of Velez, 
Originally found in 1919, the book was written on wooden planks which were lost in the 1940s. It was written in an old Slavonic language mixed with an unknown language. It was found by a Russian lieutenant, Fedor Eisenbeck. He later handed the planks to Russian writer and researcher Yuri Myrolibov, who studied, photographed, and translated them before they were lost during the Nazi invasion of Brussels, where he had them. A sort of a biblical legend, the text chronicles the ancient Slavs in the 10th century BC, where they moved through various areas in Europe, encountering other historical groups along the way, even having a run-in with the Babylonian king Nabonassar in the 8th century BC. Telling from the surviving manuscripts, European scholars have concluded that the text was a forgery. All of the strange claims and obsessive need to prove the Ukrainian connection to some Aryan past weren't necessary to show deep roots within the country. There are sites and artifacts that prove that Ukraine was in fact home to a very ancient people. Northwest of Ukraine, in modern-day Russia, we found female figurines in Avdivo and Kostenki, rendering them part of the Avdivo-Kostenki people. These figurines go as far back as 22,000 years before the present time, making them some of the oldest modern artifacts in the world. Among the pieces found is the world's oldest known representation of the swastika, found on the figure of a bird carved out of a mammoth tusk. Along with these finds is the massive site of Ukraine's Kamyana Moila, spoken of by researchers as far back as 1739. It was officially investigated by serious archaeological projects beginning in the early 20th century. Within its massive 32,000 square foot area are many large life-size figures and scattered petroglyphs with images of animals. And there are also interesting scenes assumed to be of religious importance. Although no writings have been unearthed and deciphered, there is definitely evidence of a culture going far back into the Upper Paleolithic era. This coincides with the Indo-European Migration Theory, which states that the hub of ancient European ancestors resided in central Eurasia, which then was in Ukraine and the upper areas north of the Black Sea. As far as where the languages and myths of the modern Indo-European people originated, that is still debated. Out of the ancient roots of the pastoral peoples that resided in Ukraine arose its first notable civilization, which rivals Sumer in age. These people are known as the Tripilia. Archaeologist John Chapman of Durham University in England has been studying Ukraine's ancient sites for many years and has concluded, as is reflected in a 2020 online article titled, Ancient Megasites May Reshape the History of the First Cities that the Tripilia people were behind some of the most impressive urban villages that are found throughout the ancient sites of Ukraine. These urban centers are the oldest and most sophisticated in that part of the world. These villages are just as old as some of Sumer's oldest cities going back about 6,000 years, but in some cases exceed them in their massive size. Known as megasites, these villages had a unique style of constructing large buildings with broad expanses of land housed by sometimes a low population. We have found about 150 different Tripilian sites. The sites could have been used for anything, but most scholars agree they were spiritually centered, especially because they weren't used as permanent housing. Usually, with a large altar-like area in the middle of the sites, Every 60 to 80 years, the massive villages would be systematically burned down and the people would resettle and rebuild elsewhere. The Tripilia consisted of sophisticated people who were intellectual builders, farmers, and religiously centered people who seemed to place importance on the goddess aspect of nature. Not only would they burn their settlements, but would burn their belongings, animals, idols, and dead before moving along as some sort of grand sacrifice to the archetypal spirits. Interestingly, when the Tripilia culture was first discovered in the late 19th century, it was a stupendous find for the Soviet Union. The state tried to paint the ancient culture as some early form of communism to bring legitimacy to its politics. Once scholars started to realize that the Tripilia were not entirely classless and had a societal structure, the Soviet Union put an end to funding the research and threatened any scholar who would look further into the Tripilia 
and present any work that would discredit the mainstream narrative of the communist state. The Trapilia were peaceful, spiritual people who are mostly remembered as a matriarchal society based on their artwork and reverence for agriculture and nature. They lasted for about 800 years until they were wiped out by the growing eastern tribes belonging to a patriarchal society with roots to what are known as the Yamnaya culture. The Yamnaya culture, coupled with the Kurgan people and Kurgan hypothesis, spread east to west. They seemingly vanquished the areas they passed through and set up what would become the start of the modern patriarchal European age. A 2015 study in DNA from the area showed that right around the decline of the Trapilian culture, 3500 to 2700 BC, the Yamnaya genes began to replace about 75% of the gene pool. The history behind the Indo-European migration was used by colonists to justify racially charged politics. Especially in India, there has been a racial ideology in place since the late 19th century that states that the civilization and myths of the Hindus were brought by white Sanskrit-speaking people known as the Aryans. This is called the Aryan Invasion Theory. It was a theory popularized by Christian colonist Max Mueller. It's a deep subject all in itself. Briefly stated, the theory states that outside nomad tribes of lighter-skinned people brought culture and language to the Indian subcontinent. Through the years, Indian nationalists combated the theory with the out-of-India theory, stating that civilization and culture were brought to the rest of Eurasia from out of India. Many genetic studies have been done on this historical predicament from both sides. Taking some recent work published from the Indian side of scholarship, a study done by Vasant Shinde, an archaeologist and vice chancellor of Deccan College, and Naraj Rai, head of the ancient DNA lab at the Birbal Sani Institute for Paleosciences, we can gain some insight. Their work was published in 2019, and assuming they would be biased on the outcome, the results are interesting. In the online article titled, Two New Genetic Studies Upheld Indo-Aryan Migration, so why did India media report the opposite by Shoaib Daniyal? We learned that as the information came out, many Indian nationalists manipulated the data towards the out of India theory, including one of the co authors of the papers, Vasant Shinde. However, his colleague Naraj Rai, the geneticist on the project, was quoted as saying, This is not my statement. I don't agree with this statement. Scholars abroad have analyzed the findings of the research papers such as American geneticist and science writer Razib Khan, who stated that this research points strongly to the fact that Aryans migrated to the Indian subcontinent. Simply put, it's unanimously agreed now within mainstream scholarship that around 2000 to 1500 BC, there was a steady influx of Indo-Aryans into India who brought the Sanskrit language and subsequently the oldest of the Vedas and other aspects of Indo-Aryan culture. The original theory was titled the Aryan Invasion Theory, stating that the Aryans brutally invaded the area and subjugated the natives. We have now changed the concept to the Aryan Migration Theory, realizing that this was a gradual and consensual process between Eurasian humans over the span of many centuries. This history continues to be controversial and scandalous, although it doesn't have to be. The racial tension spawns from the very word Aryan. The word was used by 19th century British colonists to refer to a group of white immigrators from the Russian steppe who subjugated the darker-skinned natives and assimilated them into their culture, which would eventually flourish into the Hindu caste system. Colonist scholars attempted to use the Vedas as evidence for this history. The Vedas, specifically the Rig Veda, the oldest of the Sanskrit texts, talk about a pastoralist warrior group of people known as the Aryans. The Vedas mention that these people entered India some legendary time ago. The Vedas speak of a war between the horse-riding Aryans and the native Dasas or Dasyus. There is verbiage used in the Vedas describing the Dasas as dark-skinned, such as Rig Veda 1.130.8. Indra, in battles, helps his Aryan worshipper, he who hath hundred helps at hand in every fray, in phrase that win the light of heaven. Plaguing the lawless, he gave up to Manu's seed the dusky skin, blazing 
swear. He burns each covetous man away. He burns the tyrannous away. In this verse, the enemies are referred to as the dusky skin. The Aryans are referred to as worshippers of the Vedic god Agni. In this next passage, from the Rig Veda, we see the description of dark skin continued. For fear of thee forth fled the dark-hued races, scattered abroad, deserting their possessions, when glowing, O oh, Agni. Again, here we see the enemies of the Aryan as dark-hued races. Some scholars read the descriptions as metaphors for the spirit of the people as being darkened, evil, and lawless, which is overpowered by the light of the Vedic gods. Aryan, however, was never used as a racial term. Aryan comes from the root word Arya, which means noble. Therefore, the Aryans were noble people, probably with a mix of different complexions. Aryan was a social cultural term, not a racial one. Others have used the term Aryan and the Vedic tales as evidence for white people subjugating darker skinned natives. Whatever the case, what we know for sure is the Indo Aryan migration took place around 2000 to 1500 BC, and the Rig Veda was written right around the same time. So, there is a cohesive history attempting to be conveyed to us by our Eurasian human ancestors. Interestingly, Arya, the root word for Aryan, is also used by the Indo Iranians, who are cousins to the Indo Aryans. In the ancient Persian Zoroastrian epics, which like Hinduism, were influenced by the Vedas, we find the word Arya. In the Avesta, the Zoroastrian holy scripture, the term Arya basically means that which is sacred or worthy of praise, and Aryan is a worshipper or believer, coinciding with the Rig Veda description of the Aryans or Aryans being worshippers of the gods of light. Over 1,000 years before the European colonizers used the term Aryan to their political means, the Persian king Darius referred to himself as an Aryan from the land of the Aryans. Persia is modern-day Iran. Iran and the Iranians stem from the word Aryan. But the Persian Empire began about 700 years after the Indo-European migration. The Yamnaya people from the Russian steppe were those who were genetically responsible for the major influx of Indo-European people into India. The Aryans were a mixture of Indo-Iranians who were a branch from the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. Thus, the process of how ancient Proto-Indo-Europeans spread out, mixed, and created with the various indigenous groups of Europe and the Middle East was a gradual and complex one. Mythical scriptures need to simplify history because they aren't written as history. They're written as religious and spiritual manuals that use history as a background. All the debates about race and who started what culture and what myth is important historically, but they shouldn't be used to justify any inhumane acts against one another. The historical truths we find hidden in our past should unite us and have us realize how connected, beautiful, and intricate our human family tree really is. The importance of what we're dealing with here is the roots of modern humans and how they may tie to our mythical past. Many scriptures of various cultures speak of an ancient flood that caused the death of many people and the necessary migration of the saved few. According to the various tales, like the one found in the Bible, for example, mankind spread out and populated the world soon after the flood subsided. All this history of the Proto-Indo-Europeans dates to the earliest of our known recorded history, about 7,000 years ago. Of course, there are remnants of humans before then, but the major progress began about seven to 8,000 years ago. The earliest of modern civilizations took place around the Black Sea, which made their way outward eventually to the Middle East and the rest of Europe. Interestingly, there has been some in-depth research showing that there were two severe floods that followed back-to-back -back from the Black Sea right around 7,000 years ago. This was about 2,000 years before we started to see the major cultures rise out of Ukraine and Sumer, which led to the eventual Aryans and modern Europe. Professor Dr. Petko Dimitrov, a Bulgarian marine geologist and oceanographer from the Institute of Oceanology at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences in Varna, has shed some light on this over the years along with other colleagues. In a paper 
published in 2018 for the Journal of Earth Science and Climatic Change, we find that in 1982, Dimitrov found clay deposits 100 meters below the Black Sea. His colleagues, Professors Ryan and Pittman, found an old shoreline 155 meters down, which indicates a massive and quick flood. Robert Ballard, American retired Navy officer and professor of oceanography who discovered the sunken Titanic, also did some excavations in the Black Sea. He and his team found remnants of a house about 300 feet down, also concluding that a massive flood occurred about 7,000 years ago. The oldest Ukrainian culture, the Trapilia, go back to 55,000 BC. The Sumerians go back to about 4,500 BC. The difference between the Black Sea flood and the onset of modern civilization would be about 2,000 years. According to the research done by these various teams, there were two floods caused by major ice cap melting that resulted in the Black Sea, along with the other major seas in Europe, to overflood. The first wave of flooding occurred around 9000 BC, which was followed by the Black Sea flood in 7000 BC. Gobekli Tepe in Turkey goes back to the time of the first flood, which could account for its strange commemorative purposes. The site, strangely, was intentionally buried as if they knew it needed to be preserved. In the Bible, we are told that mankind wasn't civilized until after the flood when the kingdom of Babylon was formed by Nimrod. This coincides with our archaeological history showing that the first major civilization occurred in Sumer with its sister cultures Akkad, Babylon, and Assyria arising out of it. The story as is told in Genesis 6 also centers around the enigmatic Nephilim, who were an abomination born out of the intercourse of angels and humans. Described as beings of tall and strange stature, it was God's intention to also wipe out this genetic line of beings by the flood. Genesis 6-4 tells us that these beings were on earth in those days and also afterward. Researchers like Brian Forrester have been researching the strange elongated skulls found throughout the world. His DNA findings of the ones found in Peru show that these royal people were not native to the Americas, but belonged to the haplogroup H2A, which would put them in the Black Sea area. Could these people have been the few surviving Nephilim hiding that we are told were alive in those days and afterward? The origins of our modern timeline, going back to about 7000 BC, are mysterious. There is a lot yet to uncover. Could our ancient scriptures be trying to tell us something that mainstream institutions don't want to admit?